basically know the script by heart. So um, yeah, it's just just a, it's just a good time. And we've had some lineup changes, but it, it's a it's a lot of fun. It's the only time the entire radio station gets together and does something. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So like two sentences before. It's time for me to step up there. It's a little anxious, but I get I get through it every year. Do I get nervous? Sometimes I get nervous. I have a new hairstyle this time, so I'm kind of nervous about that. I hope it goes over well. Uh, I don't have any lines, per se, but uh, my presence is very important to the performance. Would you like to meet the real radio players? In the role of man one, Real Radio Production Director, Chris Michaels. Man two, from the hideout, please welcome El Jefe. In the role of gentleman from the Shannon Burke Show, Stedman. Playing the Cratchit children this evening, please welcome Drunky the Bear. Chunks, Tommy Bateman, and Cabin Boy. In the role of the Cratchit's eldest son this evening, from the hideout, J-Dubs. Playing fan from the Phillips file, welcome back, Jana Banana. In the character of second boy, Tuttle. I was told an hour or two ago I will be playing Belle. Thank you. Uh, first boy, <laughs> playing first boy this evening from the Shannon Burke Show, Soul Brother Kevin. <laughs> SBK. In the role of Fred, please welcome Jack Bradshaw. The ghost of Marley, Otto. Our musical accompaniment tonight, we are very pleased to welcome to the stage, Jeff Howell. Tiny Tim, here's Daniel. Playing the ghost of Christmas past, the sexy Savannah. In the role of the ghost of Christmas present from the monsters, Black Bean. <laughs> the ghost of Christmas yet to come, Dirty Jim. Playing Mrs. Cratchit, please welcome back Moira. As Bob Cratchit, Russ Rollins. This evening, taking the role of Scrooge, Shannon Burke. And of course, your narrator, Mr. Jim Phillips.
Stop it! Stop what I say. Get away from here. We'll have no singing around here. Understand me? No singing. A Merry Christmas, sir. Get away, I say. No need to wish him a Merry Christmas. That's old Scrooge. Yes, that is old Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. It is the afternoon before Christmas Day in the year of our Lord, 1844. Despite the bitterly cold weather, all of London is in a festive mood. But there is no happy expression on Ebenezer Scrooge's lined face as he closes the front door of his warehouse and returns to his office. He throws a glowering look at his clerk, Bob Cratchit. Satisfied that the poor wretch is hard at work, Scrooge adjusts his spectacles. Then, without warning... A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug? Surely you don't mean that, Uncle. Merry Christmas, indeed. What right have you to be so merry? You're poor enough. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money, a time for finding yourself a year older and not one hour richer? If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. You keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. I came here to ask you to spend Christmas Day with Peg and me. No. But we want nothing from you, Uncle, other than your company. Won't you change your mind and have dinner with us? Good afternoon, Fred. A Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Bah, humbug. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Scrooge, but there's a gentleman here to see you. What about it, Cratchit? He didn't say, sir. Ah, uh, good afternoon, sir. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley, my former partner, has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Then I have no doubt his liberality will be well represented by his surviving partner. What do you want? At this festive season, Mr. Scrooge, we try and make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Many thousands are in want of common necessity. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. And the workhouses, are they still in operation? I wish I could say they were not. How much shall I put you down for, Mr. Scrooge? Nothing. Nothing? Exactly. Let the deserving people of yours go to these establishments I have mentioned. Most of them would rather die than to do then that. Then let them do that and help decrease the surplus population. I'm busy. Good afternoon to you. Very good, Mr. Scrooge. Merry Christmas to you. Charity. Ah, humbug. Uh, Mr. Scrooge, sir. Well, what is it, Cratchit? I, I was wondering... You were wondering if you could go home. Yes, sir. It's getting late. Yes, go on. You'll want tomorrow, I suppose? If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th day of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. But be here all the earlier the next day, understand? Yes, sir, and, and Merry Christmas. Christmas. Hum. A few minutes later, Scrooge leaves his warehouse and makes his way to his melancholy chambers of gloomy suite of rooms. By the light of a single flickering candle, he eats his cold supper. And then, to save lighting his stove, Ebenezer Scrooge retires for the night. The minutes tick away. Scrooge sleeps uneasily, tossing from side to side. Suddenly, he awakes with a start. Walking toward him and dragging a heavy chain is a gray, dim figure of a man. It stops at the foot of the bed. Who are you? What do you want with me? Who are you? Ask me who I was. Your... Your... Yes. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. But it cannot be so. You're dead. You don't believe in me? No, you're nothing but an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese. You are wrong, Ebenezer. I am the ghost of Jacob Marley. Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. No, no, I don't believe it. It is then doomed to wander through the world. You are chain, Jacob. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I wore it of my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you? I, I don't understand. This chain I wear is as heavy as the one you are now forging. You talk strangely, Jacob. For seven years I have been dead, traveling the whole time. No rest, no peace, 
Only remorse. But you were always shrewd, Jacob. Aye, too shrewd. A good man of business. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. But I heeded none of these. Instead, I thought only of money. And what is wrong with making money? That is your fault, Ebenezer, as it was mine. That is why I am here tonight. That is part of my penance. I am here to warn you, to help you escape my fate. You have one chance left. Tell me how this chance will come. My time draws near. I must go. Tonight you will be haunted by three spirits. The first will appear when the bell strikes one. Expect the second at the stroke of two. And the third as the bell tolls three. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over with? No. And heed them when they appear. Remember, it is your last chance to escape my miserable fate. As Scrooge stares in fright and silence, the wraith-like figure of his deceased partner dissolves into space. Then exhausted by the ordeal, Scrooge drops off to sleep. Twelve o'clock comes, time passes, then... The curtains of Scrooge's bed are drawn aside, but by no visible hand. There by the bed stands an unearthly visitor, a strange figure like a child. Its hair is white, and in its hand it holds a sprig of fresh green holly. Scrooge stares and then speaks. Are you the spirit whose coming was told me by Jacob Marley? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Rise and walk with me. Where? Out through the window. But we are three stories above the ground. I am only a mortal. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. What are we to do? I am going to help reclaim you. Come, walk with me. Out into the night, into the past. Tell me, ghost of Christmas past, where are we? Look down, Ebenezer, and remember back. Why, why, of course, the river, the meadows, and, and why, this is my, my old school. I went there as a lad, but no one is about. It is Christmas holiday. Let us look into this study hall. Empty, except for a young boy sitting at his desk, his hands, his head and his hands left behind. He's crying. Poor chap, no place to go at Christmas. Ah, now he's looking up. Do you recognize him? Why, it's... What is his name? Ebenezer Scrooge. I wish... Ah, but it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. There were some boys singing Christmas carols outside my warehouse door yesterday afternoon. I drove them away. Let us see another Christmas. It is a year later, another Christmas. And again, there is the school. That boy standing in the driveway, pacing up and down. It is I. And what do you see? A coach coming up the driveway. Now it has stopped. And a little girl gets out. Look, she's hugging me. It's Fan, my sister. Listen to what she says. I've come to bring you home, dear brother. Father's not mean anymore, and he says you're never coming back here. And from now on, we'll always be together. Just think, together for the first time in four years. Your sister was a delicate creature, kind, big-hearted. So she was. So she was. She died comparatively young. She left one child behind her. Yes, Fred, my nephew. He was in to wish you a Merry Christmas yesterday. Yes, yes, he did so. Please take me back. Not yet. There is one more shadow. No more. I do not wish to see it. You must. The years have passed in this house below. Look, there sits a girl, a beautiful girl. It's Belle. The girl you were to marry, and there you sit next to her, a young man in your prime. Only now your face begins to show the signs of avarice. 
There is a greedy, restless motion in your eyes. Listen to what she is saying to you. It matters very little to you. Another idol has displaced me, a golden one. You hold money more important than me or anything else for that matter. And I'm going to grant your wish, free you from marrying me. That is the way you wish it, Ebenezer. I feel sorry for you. Spirit, show me no more. Today, Belle is a happy woman, surrounded with her fine children. Those children might have been yours if you hadn't been so selfish. Take me back. Haunt me no more. I beg of you, don't. The steeple clock has just finished striking the second hour of Christmas Day. Scrooge finds himself back in his bedroom. Slowly, his door, though bolted, swings open. Good morning, Ebenezer. Welcome me. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You're practically a giant, yet you have a young face. Have you never seen the like of me before? Never. I have many brothers, over 1,800 of them. One for each Christmas since the very first. And you are here to take me with you? Yes. I trust you will profit by your journey. Touch my robe, Ebenezer. Those people in this church, they seem very happy. They are. For they are giving thanks for all the joys brought to them during the year. And the crew of that ship over there. Look, they are shaking hands with the captain. Wishing him a Merry Christmas. But come, we have not much time left. And there's still another place we must visit. It is a very poor, poor house in a poor section of London. This one directly below us. Indeed it is. Who, may I ask, lives here? An underpaid clerk named Bob Cratchit. The Bob Cratchit who is employed by me? The very same. That woman, those four children. His wife and family. Coming up the stairs right now, that, that's Cratchit. He's carrying a young boy. His fifth child, Tiny Tim. He carries a crutch. Because he is crippled. But, but the doctor. Cratchit cannot afford a doctor. Not on 15 shillings a week. But shh. Listen. Good afternoon, everyone. And a most Merry Christmas. Father, Tiny Tim. And how did Tiny Tim behave at church? As good as gold and better. I was glad to be able to go to church. That's because I wanted the people to see that I'm a cripple. Now, now that's a peculiar thing to say, Tiny Tim. No, it isn't. That's because I was in God's house, and it was God who made the blind able to see and the lame able to walk. And when the people at church saw me in my crutch, I was hoping they would think of what God can do and that they'd say a prayer for me. I'm certain they must have prayed for you. And one of these days, I'm going to get well, and that'll mean I can throw away this crutch and run and play like the other boys. You will, Tim, one of these days. And now, Mother, the big question, when will dinner be ready? Uh, it's ready now. Just about the finest goose you've ever seen. Martha, you carry it in. Tom, you fetch the potatoes and turnips. Dick, Peter, set the chairs around the table. And I'll sit between father and mother. This is going to be the best Christmas dinner anyone could hope for. And I'm the luckiest man in the world, having such a fine family. It isn't a very big goose, is it? I could eat the whole bird myself, I believe. It is all Bob Cratchit can afford. His family doesn't complain. To them, that meager goose is a sumptuous banquet. And more important, much more important, Ebenezer. Go on. They are a happy and united group. Look at their shining faces. Listen to them. Oh, what, what a superb dinner we've had. The tempting meat, the delicious dressing. And the plum pudding, Father. Don't forget that. That pudding was the, great, was the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since her marriage. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. I must confess, it was good. And now the crowning touch, the punch. Uh, okay, here we go. Get your glasses. You, Peter, Dick, Tom, Martha, Tiny Tim, and last but far from least, you, Mother. And not to forget myself, there. A toast. First, to the founder of the feast, the man who has made it possible, I give you Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. He's a hard, stingy, unfeeling man. You know he is, Robert, better than anybody else. My dear, remember, Christmas Day. 
I'm sorry. Very well. I'll drink to his health. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas to him. To Mr. Scrooge. To Mr. Scrooge. And now a toast to us. A Merry Christmas to us all. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us. Everyone. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I, I see a vacant seat in the chimney, chimney corner. corner. And a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say he will live, that he will be spared. Why concern yourself about him? Isn't it better that he die and de decrease the surplus population? But these poor people must be helped. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are they still in operation? Don't taunt me. It is time for us to go. No, no, I wish to remain. I can remain no longer. Touch my robe and we shall go. No, no, I say. Spirit, don't desert me. I need your help. As Ebenezer Scrooge comes to his senses, he discovers himself standing on the street outside of his lodgings. A heavy snow is falling, blanketing a sleeping London. The wind has died down. It is still early Christmas morning. Ebenezer! Ebenezer Scrooge! You are the, the third and last? I am the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You're about to show me shadows of things that have not happened, but will, but will happen in time before us. Is that so, Spirit? Yes, Ebenezer. That is correct. I tremble at going with you. I fear what I have to see. Come, Ebenezer. Why do we stop here on this street corner, Spirit? Those two men standing there. Do you know them? Why, well, yes, I, I do business with them. Their conversation is interesting. When did he die? Last night, I believe. I thought he'd never die. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. Well, one thing is certain, he didn't leave it to charity. Are you going to his funeral? Not unless a free lunch is provided. A very good point. I can't say that I blame you. Spirit, this dead man they are discussing, who is he? I will show you. This room, it, it's too dark to see. In front of you is a bed. On it lies a man, the body of the man those men in the street were discussing. And no one has come to claim his body? No one, for he left not a friend by him. Come closer and look into his face. No. Look. Spirit, this is a fearful place. Let's go. Look at the face of this unclaimed man. I would do it if I could, but I haven't the power. Let me see some tenderness connected with death. If I don't, that lonely body in this dark room will ha forever haunt me. Yes, I know of such a home, one where there is tenderness connected with death. It's over here on this poor street and in this dismal house. But this house? Why, well, yes, I've been here before. Bob Cratchit, my clerk, lives here. There is Mrs. Cratchit and her eldest son, your eyes, Mother. You'll strain them work in this bad light. I'll stop for a while. I wouldn't show weakness to your father when he comes home. It's time he was here. Past it, rather. But these days he walks slower than he used to, Mother. I have known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Very fast, indeed. He was very light to carry, and your father loved him so. It was no trouble. There's your father now at the door. You're late tonight, Robert. Yes, I, I'm late. I'll get you some tea for you, Father. Thank you, son. You went there today, Robert? Yes, I, I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. I'll see it soon. I promised him I would walk there every Sunday. My poor tiny Tim. <sighs> at last he got rid of his crutch. Yes, at last he did. Our poor tiny Tim. Tell me, Spirit, why did tiny Tim have to die? Come. There is still another place to visit. A graveyard? Why do we pause here? That tombstone 
Read the name on it. Before I do, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? The inscription on the tombstone. It, it reads, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, spirit, no, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. But for this lesson, I will honor Christmas in my heart. But will you? Oh, yes, I will, I will try and keep it alive all year. I will not live in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lesson that all these spirits have taught me. Oh, tell me there is hope that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Tell me, tell me there's hope that I may sponge away the writing on the stone. Oh, what am I, what am I holding on to? The bedpost? I'm in my own bed. Home. Those bells. It must be Christmas Day. Christmas Day. I wonder if it really is. We shall see. I'll open the window. You, boy, down there. Eh? What day is it today, my fine lad? Today? Why, Christmas Day, of course. And to think the spirits have done it all in one night. What did you say, sir? Do you know the poulter is in the next street? I should hope I did. Not an intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? The one as big as me. What a delightful boy. Yes, the one as big as you. It's hanging there now. Go and buy it. I'm in earnest. Here's the money. Catch. Deliver it to Bob Cratchit, who lives on Golden Street in Camden Town. But, sir, there will be considerable change left over. Keep it, my boy. Keep it. Oh, thank you, sir. And, boy. Yes, sir? Don't let Mr. Cratchit know who sent the turkey. It's something of a surprise. Uh, and something else. Yes, sir? A very Merry Christmas to you. What is it? Why, bless my soul. Yes. Yes, it is I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come for dinner. Now let me in. I have a present for your good wife. From now on, I am going to be one of your most persistent guests. I have changed my boy. You will see. Scrooge was better than his word. He did everything he promised and infinitely more. He became a persistent visitor to his nephew's home and even took Fred into business with him. He raised Bob Cratchit's salary to a figure that left that bewildered gentleman gasping. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He provided doctors for the little lad, and very soon Tiny Tim will have his wish. He'll be able to throw away his crutch and run and play like the other boys. As for the three spirits, Ebenezer Scrooge never saw them again. That was due to the fact that Scrooge, for the rest of his days, helped keep alive the spirit of Christmas. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, the real radio players. Thank you all very, very much. We'd like, uh, we'd like you to, if you have not had the privilege of one of our other events, to have a few minutes to spend with the president of the Mustard Seed, Carol Kane. So at this point, I will turn it over to Mr. Jim Phillips. Thank you once again for, uh, for joining us this evening for the eighth annual Real Radio Christmas Carol. I always like to take the opportunity after the event to at least take somebody who's been in our, in our crew and point them out for a job well done. And I think this time, 
you know, when, when I think of Jacob Marley, I can't, other than Scrooge, I can't think of anybody more tight with his money than, than Jacob. And then I'm thinking, who better to play the role than the person who's probably tightest with his money <laughs> at Real Radio than Otto? He's perfect for the role, and we appreciate his involvement as we appreciate you joining us tonight. I'm not going to go into a big, long story about how we became involved with Mustard Seed. I think the best thing we can do is invite Carol Kane up here to say a few words and be as uh, brief as possible. Otherwise, uh, she'll be here all night long, and you'll be crying all night long. So without further ado, the founder of Mustard Seed, Carol Kane. dressed up for Jim tonight because he does never want me to talk very long so I thought if I got dressed up he'd let me stay on a little bit longer <laughs> but I want to be able to thank everybody from Hard Rock uh, all the employees here that gave up their time to help a family to be here tonight is a real blessing and also to everybody here who performed tonight I can't thank them enough. And um, a happy Hanukkah to Moira. Jim found me eight years ago, and I thank God every day that he did find me because he has been a true blessing to me and to our organization and to all the families that we've been able to help uh, over the last eight years with his, all the fundraising events that he has put on for us, along with the Monsters of the Midday and everybody involved. Mid-morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Russ. <laughs> Ooh, beg your pardon. <laughs> I don't want to get him upset, that's for sure. <laughs> they are all such a true blessing to all the families that we help. In the last eight years, I always try to let Jim know that with, and everybody else on the cast know that every time they do something for us and they've blessed someone, I, I know that the blessings get returned back to them. In the last eight years, on the average, 6,000 individuals are blessed by the mustard seed, and that's children and their moms and dads. Over the last year, eight years, about 40 to 45,000 have received the blessings from all of you. The mustard seed is in its 21st year. Beginning January 1st, they will be in their 22nd year. This year alone, I want all of you to know, because I think it's important. I got all the figures yesterday, but just this year, 5,726 children and moms and dads received something to better their life at the mustard seed. And you out there who financially give and come to these events, you also are to be applauded for being helpful to help me to help others. And you deserve an applause also. I don't have much time left. How many of you here are first time people here? In reflecting over 
the last 21 years of the mustard seed, many things have touched my heart. Many things have sent me back to my office, crying my eyes out. Jim, Moira, and a lot of the cast here know many of those stories. Just to take you back a little bit. Family coming in, picking out their furniture, and the mom is in the dish room, picking out her dishes and her pots and pans. And her daughter comes running up, and she has a handful of spoons in her hand. And I looked at the little girl, and I thought, ooh, man, she's got a lot of spoons there. But I didn't dare say anything to her because as she was running up to her mom, she said, Mom, Mom, look at this, Mommy. And the Mommy turns around and she says to her Mommy, Look, Mom, I found some spoons. Now we don't have to share our spoons when we have our cereal in the morning. We don't think in this country that we have these problems, but we do just like the child that was so excited to get a bed. And all the beds in the building were exactly alike, but he wanted to pick out his own. So I let him go pick out his own bed, and as he picked it out, he was so happy, just smiling from ear to ear. And I thought to myself, how wonderful that this little kid is so happy to get a bed. And then as I looked at him, he was kissing it from one end to the other because that was his bed. And he was going to be able to take that home with him that night. The other day, family was loading up their furniture and the two little boys were standing there and so I brought them aside, and we sat down, we talked, and I said, isn't it exciting, your mommy and daddy getting all this furniture? And they looked like this. Yeah. I said, what's the matter, honey? Well, we, we don't have any toys to play with. I said, well, what happened, honey? He said, well... And then another little brother piped up, well, the storm took everything away. And I said, oh, you mean the hurricane? And he said, yes, that big storm. And I said, would you like to have some toys? And their face and the, just a big smile and the eyes got so big. And I said, do you want to go pick out some toys? Yeah, yeah, he says. I said, okay, come with me. And the mommy and daddy were going to come with him. And I said, no, this is their treat. You're getting yours. Now the children are going to get theirs. So if you've ever visited the mustard seed, we have a toy room for all of our people who have suffered from disasters or from abuse, or from fires. So I took the two little boys in there, and I said, okay, now you look at all those toys. Wow! This looks like Toys R Us, he says. I said, yeah, and you can pick out anything you want. Really? I said, yes. Really, anything you want. And then I thought a minute, and I said, hmm, I better make a limit on this. <laughs> so I said, you can each pick out four favorite things, each of you. So I turned around, and I walked away, and all of a sudden, I see the door open. And they got their hands full like this, and they did not take any more than four toys each. And I said, you are really good kids in there. And he said, this is so nice. And then I saw him go over to his mommy, and I saw him whisper to his mommy, 
and his mommy came over to me. She says, oh, I'm so embarrassed. She says, but my son happened to see a bike in there. And he wants to know he lost his bike in the storm. Do you suppose he could have that bike? So I went over to the little boy. I said, hmm, your mom tells me you want a bike, huh? And his eyes got so big, and he got a big smile. I said, did you see a favorite bike back there? Yeah. I said, would you like to have that bike? Yeah. I said, well, you go pick out that bike, and you can take that bike home with you. And I said, now, if your little brother wants one, too, make sure you get one for your brother, too. So they both walked out with their bikes, and they put them on the truck. And I'll tell you, the, the amount of happiness that came over my, just, just myself, I just couldn't explain to you how wonderful of a feeling it is to see these little children who have lost everything and then get to see the smiles on their face. And it's all because of you and your giving is the reason why I had the joy of seeing the faces of the children the smiles on their faces. And once they were crying, and now they are happy. And you deserve all the credit, all of you. Thank you. And I do wish you all a wonderful and a blessed holiday, and I hope many blessings are returned to each one of you for the giving that you give to others. God bless you. Have a safe trip home. I forgot to mention uh, when I first came out here, uh, Russ Rollins uh, from the Monsters, of course, whom I consider the best self-promoter in the business, the best I've ever seen in this business. <laughs> Many times to my dissatisfaction, of course. But he, he really is the best, and he's been the best ever since he started on, on the air at, at Real Radio. And this year, he, he came up with the idea of holding a telethon to raise money for the uh, Mustard Seed Toy Drive. And you rate how much? $30,000 they raised. Which is, which is certainly a testament to, uh, to his genius and, and to everybody who's a fan of his program, of which I am one of his biggest fans. Um, before we go, I think we need to say thank you very much and job well done to Shannon Burke for taking over the role of Scrooge. And by, and by tradition, of course, we always like Scrooge to hand over the check to uh, Carol for the amount of money, money that we've raised through this particular performance. So Scrooge, if you uh, would please step up, $9,420. Not too bad. Once again, thanks to everyone here at Hard Rock Live, especially the crew backstage who got us all set up and has to kind of put up with our ignorance because we don't really know what we're doing up here, but they do a fantastic job. And once again, of course, the biggest round of applause should go to you for, thanking, for helping out Mustard Seed and doing such a wonderful job, not just tonight, but all through the year. We thank you very much. We hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Happy Hanukkah, wonderful Kwanzaa, happy New Year, happy holidays. Thank you very much. Drive carefully. What does Christmas mean to me? Oh, gosh, you know? 
<laughs> Christmas is the look on my daughter's face when she gets up and sees that tree on Christmas morning. It's the excitement when she goes to bed and we put out milk and cookies and and it's being with all these people here. <laughs> Time off, <laughs> really, but uh, but it means getting getting closer to my family. I, I spend a lot of time away from my family, and they live uh, they, they don't even live that far away. That's what's so bad about our job sometimes. And then it gives me an opportunity to catch up, be with my family, and uh, and relax a little bit. It's family time for me. Uh, I'm gonna be with family this year. What's important, yeah. Christmas means presents. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Christmas means uh, uh, sitting around with your family and uh, watching DVDs that you get given to you. And you get to sit around and talk and laugh and joke with your family that you don't get to do the entire year. You get to do it on Christmas. It's, it's, it's family stuff to me. We've been doing this for, I believe, 10 years. No. What did we say? I don't know. Don't ask that question. Is there anything you like to add? No. I like to redo this whole thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't get to see your family most of the time through the year, and this is the time to, you know, spend time with your loved ones. It's a time for, uh, you know, uh, giving uh, not only to your family but to others. What's this Christmas mean to you? Uh, debt, big debt, 40, 50, 60, 100. It's debt. Being, sharing, spending time with family, friends. Christmas means uh, to get family, spending, being together, love, and uh, getting presents. And getting presents. That's what he said. But it's also meaning being together, right? Yep. Right. I love you. Thank you. Just a, just a time to, to you know reconnect with family and friends. I try to uh, win the block with the Christmas display in my house every uh, every year. So uh, we're big on Christmas. Yeah, happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Do what you can. You look good. I gotta, I gotta get back to my other job. I'm a dealer at the Rio in Vegas. So. Uh, happy New Year. Do it.